Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Du Du Gong um, will, define, will defend the academic thesis, cooperative games, and mechanisms for division problems. May I invite you to present the summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to my PhD defense. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dodogun, and uh, my PhD thesis is cooperative games and the mechanisms for division problems. So it uh, includes two parts. In the first part, we focus on cooperative games. And Please stand behind the microphone. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, in the first part, we focus on cooperative games, and in the second part, we focus on non-cooperative games. And uh, in the first part, we introduce a new class of cooperative games, which is called two-bound core games, and we study some conclusion about it. And uh, in the second part, we focus on mechanisms for division problems. The first one is about bankruptcy problems, and the second one is about division problems with signal deep preference. So let's first uh, look at the first part. Uh, it's about cooperation and allocation. Assume there are three players, player one, player two, and player three. They can work together or they can work alone. If player one work alone, they can get two. If player two work alone, he can get uh, also two. If player three works alone, he can get four. If player one and player two, they work together, they can get 10. Player one and player three can get six. Player two and player three can get 12. So if these three players work together, they can get 20. So now we assume that these three players will work together. So how to allocate 20 amongst players one and two and three? It's a problem we need to focus on. And uh, here we give some solutions of this problem. Uh, first, uh, we introduce the pre-imputation set. A pre-imputation allocates a total pair of uh, more players, which means that there is no remaining pay profit of players. And then we introduce a solution which is called the core. It's a very important solution. The core consists of all collational stable pre-imputations, which means that uh, the sum of each collation they get should not less than the worth of this collation. And then we give a solution which is called the egalitarian core. The egalitarian core assigns core elements from which no one collation can be obtained by a transfer from a ritual poor one, poor one. And it's also a, a set which is the important solution. And finally, we give a signal valued solution, which is called uh, the new clearance. It assigns a unique core element that lets cographically minimize the uh, maximum excess over all collisions. Here, the excess means the gap between the, uh, the worth of the collision and uh, the payoff you can get. And uh, because the example we showed, the pre imputation set is. Uh, the, the first uh, set, mm, we assume that x1 is a pair of, of player 1, x2 is a pair of, of player 2, and x3 is a pair of, of player 3. So the sum is 20, it's a pre imputation set. And the recall is uh, not only it's a pre imputation, but also x1 gets should be trade 2 at 8, player 2 uh, gets betrayed 2 at 14, and player 3 gets between two, uh, 4 and 10. And here, the egalitarian core is a signal value the solution. It's 20 of 3 for each one. Finally, your nuclear list is also another signal value the solution. It's 5, 8, 7 for, for 3 players. And uh, what do we do? So, in your first uh, chapter, we introduced a new class of two bound core games which means that the uh, core can be described by a lower bound L and the upper bound U. Uh, and then we study all the bounds that can describe the core. Now we give some, uh, then we show that the egalitarian core is signal valued. And we prone out the explicit expressions of the egalitarian core and the new clearance. Again, we recall the example we showed. We can give uh, two bounds L, U. L is 224, U is 8, 14, 10, and then we can dis 
subscribe your call by this uh, these two bounds, and we can also have another uh, other bounds to describe your call. And here we can also see the egalitarian call is twenty of three for each player. It's also a signal value that we set. And the new clearance can be described by the by two bounds L U, as we showed here. And then we uh, introduce reduced games of two bound call games. Here, reduce the game. We consider a subset of players. Uh, again, we use the example we mentioned. There are three players, so let's say let's consider the sub subset of players, which T is one and player one and player two, and we use the new clearing as a location. Then we can get a reduced game based on these two players. So in this reduced game. Uh, they when we consider player one and player two, the, the worth of the uh, great collision is thirteen, which is the sum of the uh, the payoff of these two players, and the, the worth of player one is two, which is uh, let's say player one can work alone or player one can work with player three. So we take the maximum of player ones. Uh, was if if they work alone or the the uh, system payoff if player one and player three work together then he gives something to player three which is a location of player three seven so in uh, so in, in this example player one can get two and player two can get five this is a reduced game and. Uh, we also get some conclusions of the reduced two-bound call games. First, we show that uh, all the reduced games with respect to call elements are again two-bound call games. And then, the core of these reduced games can be described by the same pair of bounds. Based on these two good properties, we can axiomatically character the core, the nuclear lens, and the egalitarian core. Here, a solution is axiomatically correct if it uniquely satisfies a combination of independent properties, which means that uh, we give some good properties. We show that a solution is unique, satisfies uh, properties. So this solution is good, but in this way. Uh, now we introduce the second part. It's about mechanism design for division programs. First, we consider bankruptcy programs. A bankruptcy problem is a very simple situation. Uh, for example, here here is the instant. The instant is ten, and there are two agents. Agent one claims six, and the agent two claims seven. So we can see the total claims are more than the instant. So how to allocate the instant uh, uh, between two players, or two agents? So we give a rule which is called the construct equal words rule. It assigns the instant as equally as possible, and at the same time provides that no one can smaller his claim. So in this example, everyone can get five. And uh, what do we do? We design a mechanism for bankruptcy problems. Let's consider instant as a cake, and uh, we desire divide and choose mechanism. It includes two stage stages. In stage one, agent one annoys number between uh, zero and six, which means that he divided the cake in a, in a piece of cake, and then agent two annoys a number between zero and uh, the minimum of seven and the uh, <laughs> remaining cakes. Uh, then in st uh, stage two, agent one is the first one to take uh, one piece of cake. And the uh, and the, uh, the number of uh, he picks is his payoff, and then agent one choose another one left, and uh, we show that the construct equal watch location is the unique Nash equilibrium outcome. Here Nash equilibrium means that uh, here is a strategy profile, and no one can deviate this strategy and get better. And uh, in the final chapter, we introduce uh, mechanisms for division problems with signal deep purpose. 
let's consider a location uh, division problem. Let's uh, we allocate one unit of comedy to some play uh, some agents or players, and uh, every agent have a signal dipped preference. A signal dipped preference means that there is a worst point we call it deep, and the preference strategically increase in both direction away from deep. For instance, a university employer may prefer either only teaching or only research or a combination of the two. Uh, then we design a mechanism for division problems. Here is an example for two players. So in a mechanism, everyone will report a number between 0 and 1, which is his strategy. And uh, a mechanism is a map. Uh, here is an example. Normally, it's a <coughs> map uh, from uh, n dimensional to uh, a location. Uh, in this example, uh, player one, his strategy is R1. Player two, his strategy is R2. Then we use this map or this mechanism, we can get a location of these two players. Uh, so the conclusion is, your Nash equilibrium, first, no one will obtain his deep. And uh, if if his uh, if your Nash claim he receives less than his deep, then his best strategy is zero. And uh, if he receives more than his deep, then his strat best strategy is one. And uh, now the problem is which agent will claims one, which agent will claims zero. So we give uh, a definition which is called maximal collision. In this maximum collision, the agents will claim one, and the outside agents will claim zero. And the maximum collision means that members of a maximum collision prefer equal location share over obtaining zero, whereas the outside agents prefer zero obtaining an equal share of joy in a collision. So everyone will get uh, will not deviate from this strategy profile, and it's a Nash equilibrium. And they use the mechanism to get the location of this problem. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Dr. Van Merlen. Professor Van Merlen was the chair of the assessment committee and his expertise is in game theory at this university. So the floor goes to Professor Van Merlen. Thank you, dear chairman. Dear candidate, dear Dudu. Um, let me start by uh, congratulating you uh, with uh, completing uh, your uh, thesis. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, you um, wrote an excellent um, uh, manuscript. Uh, you showed that uh, you have uh, a lot of expertise in uh, various areas of uh, game theory. Uh, so, for example, you have several chapters and they are on uh, diverse uh, topics, uh, for example, the U games, bankruptcy games, and uh, social choice theory. Mm. Um, so that is, uh, I think, uh, uh, an achievement. You really show that uh, you know your way around uh, the game theory uh, topics uh, and uh, that you know how to deal with them. Um, so that's uh, very well done. Yes, thank you. Um, however, um, I'm also here to um, uh, to uh, ask you a few questions uh, yes, to sure, yeah. see uh, how, uh, how we're doing. And uh, I heard that uh, we've got the 10 minutes uh, time, so I can really uh, grill you uh, today. Uh, yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Um, so I have, uh, in principle, uh, two, uh, two questions uh, for you. Okay. Uh, uh, both on uh, chapter two. Yeah, yeah. so uh, the first one is, uh, you could say, a more philosophical question, and the <coughs> second one in more detail, but let's start with uh, the, the one that is more uh, normative. Mm. Um, so in chapter two, uh, what you, well, so your main uh, theorem, theorem 2.3, is um, has, there you show that uh, for a two-bound uh, uh, core game, so a two-bound game, you can uh, actually show that the uh, nucleolus can be written as, you could say, first give everybody his uh, minimum, yeah. uh, the Li, and then uh, divide uh, the remainder uh, according to the Talmud rule uh, in yes. uh, the corresponding bankruptcy game. Yeah. And so my question is actually, um, so that's, that's a good result, but the question is what do we learn from that? And uh, I think the, yeah, so there are several things you could do with it, and my question is a little bit how do you view uh, that uh, first of all, of course, there is simply the, you know, the, the basic uh, computational aspect that uh, 
it might uh, serve to, to uh, do computations faster than uh, in general. But maybe there's also a more, um, you could say, normative side to the story that, uh, so th that one of the rules, so for example, the Talmud rule could be used as a, you could say, a justification for the nucleolus or vice versa. Um, and maybe even have some results in that uh, area that uh, if you have a characterization or a formulation for one of them that you can actually use this to transfer it to the, to the other setting. So my question is a little bit, um, what, um, um, what do you think is uh, the main takeaway from this uh, theorem? Uh, yeah, uh, highly extended problem. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, actually we consider other solutions in cooperative games and we also consider some bankruptcy rules. Uh, yeah, we try to, uh, I mean there are many uh, important rules in bankruptcy problems, for example, the construct equal award rule, mm -hmm. uh, proportional rule, adjust proportional rule, the random arrival, such that. And the uh, uh, report is, uh, I mean, we tried these rules, but we didn't find a good conclusion in like SEM 2.3. Uh, like we first gave someone uh, the lower bound, then we use the bankruptcy rule, we get uh, 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 like classic uh, solution in comparative games. We tried like tau value, mm. and, uh, mm, also the, maybe the Shapley value, but it didn't work. So I guess uh, why the nuclear link works because there is a very important uh, theorem in the status which uh, if two, bond, two games have the same core and the one is convex, then uh, they have the same nuclear links, but this does not hold for a general solution. I guess it's why we cannot extend this theorem to other solutions. No, I understand that you cannot extend it, but my question is uh, in this context that we're currently in, um, how, uh, so what is the gain from the current uh, theorem? So I'm not asking you to, okay. you know, to see if you can really extend it, but uh, the, the current theorem uh, as it is, um, what is, uh, in your opinion, um, the most important conclusion from that theorem? So that's, that's my question. Uh, okay. The, uh, I mean, for a general game, the nuclear is, is not easy to calculate. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we need first to calculate the excess of each collision. Then we let's congraphically uh, like arrange this uh, excess. <coughs> then we find the uh, uh, the best one. I mean, it's uh, minimum ex uh, mm -hmm. let's let's call the uh, let's call graphically the ex the extensions. But uh, the time of the room for bankruptcy problems is easy to calculate. And uh, with this expression, it's we give a like explicit expression of a new clearness for this class of games. I guess it's uh, yeah. So it's, it's the computational aspect. Yeah, yeah. And do you think you could use this theorem to transfer uh, characterizations, for example, from one um, setting to the other? So there's, a, for example, the Sobolev characterization for the nucleolus. Could you translate that then to the uh, for the Talmud rule to the, uh, or the other way around. So you have characterization for the Talmud rule, you could use those then to, to characterize uh, the nucleolus. Do you think that would be possible or? Yeah, I think yes. Uh, with, uh, yeah, I guess first we, like let's say a property, let's first uh, allocate the uh, minimal exact compounds that we use the characterization of the Talmud rule, maybe it works, mm -hmm. yeah. But in our systems, we didn't use this way. We use uh, reduced games, not uh, directly related to the Talmud rule, I think. I well, you yeah. do show that it's uh, that uh, the reduce the reduction of a of a two bound core game is a two bound core game. Yeah, so yeah. that that's uh, at least uh, you know hopeful news, I would say. So, uh. <laughs> but okay. So um, in uh, terms of the time, uh, let's go to the second question, if I'm allowed. So the second question is a bit more uh, technical. So uh, in the definition of uh, the two bound core games, you use uh, these uh, two vectors L and U yeah. for the lower and the upper bound. Um, and in some sense, it's very natural to 
uh, to well naively think that the lower bound should be the individual uh, correlation value, so the VIs, yeah. and the upper bound perhaps uh, the uh, residual, so the VN minus VN minus I, right? Yeah. Um, but you have an example that that is not true in general. Yes, yes. Um, so okay, I uh, I accept that. But uh, I think there is maybe a way around that, and that's called uh, that is the notion of an exact game. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with mm, yeah, yeah, I know the it. definition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for example, if you would uh, think about a strictly exact game, mm -hmm. okay. So you know the definition, right? So every um, inequality that defines the core is uh, facet forming, right? Mm. That's what it means. Um, and suppose that a game like that is uh, a two-bound core game. Do you think that in that situation you could prove that uh, the bounds are as I just said, so that the, the lower bound is, are the VIs and the upper bounds mm. are the VN minus VN minus I's? So uh, is the question clear? Yeah, yeah, okay. it's clear. But uh, you know, I'm, I'll. I think yes, but I need to like prove it. <laughs> okay, so how would yeah. you go about to prove that? Uh, do you have some initial thoughts about what you would try or? Uh, uh, you know, normally the, the, the up bound in our two bound core games is less than your VN minus VN set minus I, and the lower bound is bigger than VI. But I guess if the game is for example, super adaptive game, maybe mm -hmm. the VI is, uh, uh, let's say, the minimum bounds, and the V minus V uh, set minus I is the maximum bound, the upper bound. So, for exact compound, um, for exact uh, games, uh, <coughs> hmm. I mean, maybe the the collation which like Vs equals to the sum of the collation, uh, sum of the payoff of this collation. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, maybe this, I mean, maybe this uh, collation determine his up bound. But I mean, in the, if you have a strictly exact game, that means that there is a co there is an uh, allocation that has exactly, for example, if you take V1, that has exactly V1 as its minimum. Yeah. And um, uh, so that means that that should be, well, the ally should be, of course, less than that. Yeah. Um, but I think there's also no other one that is below that. So that should then be, uh, in that case, at least already equal, right? So there's an, uh, there is one allocation that exactly VI, uh, and that's also the only tight coalition. So, yeah, so yeah, that's why yeah. I was thinking that maybe. Yeah, so let's say S equals to I, so it's a uh, lower bound of yeah. Two, yeah, two bound core games. Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Van den Brink, who was a member of the assessment committee, and Professor Van den Brink's expertise is also in game theory, but at the Free University in Amsterdam. The floor goes to Professor Van den Brink, and he is present online, as you can see. Yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, for giving me the floor, and uh, dear candidates, uh, I also first want to congratulate you with your very nice thesis. You have many interesting results. The thesis is overall written uh, very clear. You have discussions and conclusions at the end of each uh, chapter, although these conclusions are short. And if, if I can make a critical comment, I think it would have been nice if those conclusions would have been a bit more extensive. I think you could write a bit more about, the, say, the social impact of the results. But as I said, the results are very interesting and uh, from a game theory viewpoint, a very good thesis. So I want to start with congratulating you already with that. And then about my uh, questions, I have uh, two questions uh, on chapter four. The first question that is a bit an open question and the second question that is a bit more, more detailed and more, more clarifying on the, on the mechanism. But let, let me start with the first question. Um, so you consider two mechanisms uh, that implement uh, the CEA rule, and in the chapter you mentioned several other rules, like CEL rule, proportional rule, and Talmud rule, but in the concluding remarks, you describe how you can adapt those mechanisms to implement the CEL and proportional rules, but you, you don't say there anything about whether these mechanisms can be adapted to implement the, the Talmud rule. 
So did you think about uh, that or can you tell something about uh, if there is a problem, what kind of problem you encounter? Thank you for the question. Yes, I think it also works for a time the room because uh, uh, we introduced two mechanisms for bankruptcy problems. The first we call the division choose uh, mechanism and uh, it cannot be extended to other bankruptcy rules. But the second rule, the divide and uh, the object uh, mechanism, it can works for the CA rule, CL rule, and the time rule. I think also because all these rules satisfy the uh, bilateral pro proportion, uh, proportion uh, which means that if we for two bond co uh, two player bankruptcy game, we give a uh, uh, a rule for two players backdrop the game then we can extend this rule to uh let's say n players uh, n players backdrop the problems and if the uh, back backdrop the rule satisfy this property i think it can be extended to uh, a, a general backdrop the problem which means that we can use divide and object mechanism to character this rule so the conclusion is time to satisfy this property so we can use the uh, you know, same uh, mechanism to character this rule. Yeah. Okay, so, so and, and, and then it would also work, say, for rules like the, the Tall family. I don't know if you know this Tall family, this class of rules that contains CEL, CEA, and Talmud rule, and also, say, for the reverse Talmud rule, would it also work? Yeah. Only yeah, only we change the bilateral proportion to uh, to the corresponding rule, then we can get the mechanism for this rule. Yeah, in this series we use yeah we use uh, for CA rule, but if we change it to another rule, we can get a similar mechanism for other rules. Yeah, but it doesn't work for the first mechanism. So the, the so that would so that the, the result on the second mechanism is even more more general than than you write in your thesis. That's, so what? Uh, I guess it's maybe too obvious to get a result. So I put. Mm, yeah. Then it, I think it would have been a nice concluding uh, remark. Uh, okay. Um, well, so that's clear. And then maybe to the second question, which is a bit more detailed. And I, I mentioned that I think the thesis is very clearly and well written. Though at some pa points in the thesis, I uh, it's a bit unclear and a bit confusing for me. And the main part where it is confusing is also a bit with the with the mechanisms. I was a little bit struggling with the mechanisms uh, because it you describe these mechanisms. You you also discuss them now in your in your layman talk before this defense it's clear you have two stages uh, but then in the thesis if i get at the bottom of page uh, 58 you write that uh, it, so when you describe stage two you say that uh, a rational agent will do a certain act in stage one so you describe in the mechanism what a rational agent would do in stage one and then my my first thought is that oh I feel I would guess that that is part of the equilibrium and not part of the mechanism, and I'm a bit confused. Is it part of the equilibrium or part of the mechanism? Uh, somehow because uh, so later you, so because if it is part of the mechanism, the choice of acts of the action in stage one, then my question is: Is it then not a, a one shot game that you consider essentially? a one-shot game that is only uh, modeling the part of stage two, where the the action in stage one is taken as a part of the mechanism. So, but if it is uh, a, a one-shot game, then I'm confused why you speak about subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. You did not mention it in your layman talk within the thesis, uh, for example, in proposition 4.1 and theorem 4.5, you speak about a subgame perfect equilibrium suggesting that it is a sequential game. So to come to my question first, the, the mechanism that you describe, is it a one-shot game or is it a 
sequential game. If it is a one-shot game, what, what do you mean with a subgame perfect equilibrium? And if it is a sequential game, why do you make the action of stage one part of the description of the mechanism and not of the equilibrium? Thank you for your answer. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I guess maybe it's a one-shot game because uh, actually stage two is not, uh, I mean, it can be determined by stage one if we, if uh, players uh, uh, make their choice in stage one, basically stage two is determined by stage one. And uh, a sub game, I think a sub game is that, uh, for example, player, uh, let's say the divide and choose game, player one, player two, and player three, they divide the uh, extent uh, in, in the, uh, in, a, uh, in, uh, in a claim of uh, the discerning claims. And uh, the sum game means that if we only consider a uh, player two and player three, uh, uh, it's also a Nash equilibrium for uh, player two and player three, they claim the uh, uh, construct equal words rule. So it's a sub game of it. So, yeah. Uh, it's it's not yet clear for you. So what what is this what is the sub game? So can can you let me ask it different? Can you describe the mechanism? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, actually we have two stages, but stage two is not very important. Uh, not important. Uh, it's determined by stage one. So basically, we mentioned this in the stages. We only. Uh, consider uh, we, divi we define the strategy profile with all the strategy in stage one. And uh, um, yeah, so the sub game is, let's all consider stage one and uh, the sub game is for uh, the, uh, not, I mean the last uh, arrived players and they can claim the, uh, claim the numbers they want to uh, have. Yeah. And, and what's then a difference between a Nash equilibrium and a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium? Mm. No, it's not a subgame uh, Nash equilibrium anymore. Because. Uh, no, with a, with a... the equilibrium in proposition 4 1, for example, or in theorem 4 5. Or is, the, or is that just about the Nash equilibrium? Uh, so, so, so what is uh, four five? Because I don't have the six. So <laughs> could you help me? Ah. Okay. Sorry for uh, six, five. Okay. So if you don't have the thesis, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Do you have the thesis or? Uh, yeah. Because otherwise I can read. <laughs> no, no. Yes, it's worked for a uh, divided ob object uh, uh, mechanism, but it's not, uh, it doesn't work for the divide and uh, choose mechanism. I mean, in a second mechanism, it's a, uh, it's a sub game. Uh, I mean, a sub game Nash equilibrium because uh, uh, also because it's satisfied uh, by natural pro proportion. Uh, if if we consider a subgame of players, it also satisfies this property, so we can consider a subgame of the original game. It still works, but uh, in the first mechanism, it doesn't work because we don't use the bilateral uh, proportion for, uh, for the mechanism. Okay, okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Quant who was also a member of the assessment committee and Dr. Kwan's expertise is in game theory and operations research at Tilburg University. The floor goes to Dr. Kwan. Yeah, dear candidates, I would like to congratulate you with the completion of your manuscript. It contains a nice contribution to the literature on cooperative transferable utility games with the specific structure of the core and on mechanisms for bankruptcy problems. I have read it with pleasure and in particular chapter two. Um, 
So in chapter two, you may have made a contribution in extending some results ideas for compromise table games towards the context of two bound core games. And in particular, your contribution was in theorem 2.3 and 2.4. And my question is related to this chapter. Um, as is seen from the results, there are many similarities between two bound core games and compromise table games. Uh, I would like you to elaborate on the difference between the class of compromise table games and the class of two bound core games. And I would like to do that in three parts. So firstly, in example 2.5, you give a numerical example of a two bound core game that is not compromise table. Is there an interesting class of two bound core games that are not compromise table? So that's my first part. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, actually we talked with both and has for this question. We justified some counter example, which is two bound core game, not a compromised level game, but we didn't find a class between these two class of games. Yeah, we, are, yeah, we didn't find a class of <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then I was curious, is every two bound core game maybe equivalent with a compromise table game? That is, can every two bound core game be derived from a compromise table game by using a rescaling factor and adding an additive game? So is there some relation maybe between the two of them? Mm. Uh, I mean, if the if the up bound is uh, like wing minus wing set minus i, and uh, I, I guess maybe it's the, the a two bound core game reduced uh, uh, compromise stable game. I mean, it's a definition. But uh, in general, mm, I mean, in general, it, uh, the two bound core game does not have to comp compromise stable game. But maybe you can turn into a compromise table game by using an equivalent game. Mm. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure. You're not sure. So yeah. further research is needed. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, finally, I have a question about the, the proofs of Lemma 2.3 and the uh, Theorem 2.4. Uh, because it seems that there is some similarity in the bankruptcy game uh, used in the proof of Lemma 2.3 and the game fee had in the proof of Theorem 2.4. And I was wondering, is it possible to use either the game fee had in the proof of Lemma 2.3 or the bankruptcy game approach of Lemma 2.3 in the proof of Theorem 2.4? Uh, thanks for a question, but uh, so sorry, what is 2.3? Uh, maybe I yeah, yeah you're sure you can yeah. uh, that's where we have paronyms Thank so uh, look it up <laughs> <laughs> so it's about lemma 2.3 there you have um, a bankruptcy game and that one looks very similar to the game yeah. we had in theorem 2.4 so is it possible to align the proofs of these two theorems maybe to use one approach to both theorems or Yeah, so I just checked in the theorems. Uh, you mean how to extend the theorem to uh, two point three? Well, if you have the fee hat of, of theorem two point four, could you have also used mm. this game in the proof of lemma two point three? Or could you have done a similar approach as in two point three by having a translation? and then using a bankruptcy game and to approach that as a proof in theorem 2.4. Yeah, so yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe it's an easier way to prove theorem 2.3 because, yeah, actually we, uh, in this series we prove the theorem 2.3, use them at 2.3, which is uh, an extension of your work. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, after we prove the theorem 2.4, uh, we find the theorem of 2.4, but yeah, we didn't consider to directly to prove theorem 2.3 with theorem 2.4. Yeah, but I guess, yeah, we can, yeah, prove the directly prove theorem 2.3 with theorem 2.4, yes. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Perea, who was also a member of the assessment committee and whose expertise is in epistemic game theory at this university. The floor goes to Dr. Perea. Thank you, um, dear candidate, dear uh, Dudu. Yeah. So I also want like to congratulate you on a very nice uh, thesis. So Thank I you. read it with much pleasure. And also, I'm not an expert in uh, cooperative game theory. I think. Uh, I could see that you have established many interesting results into different areas in or related to cooperative game theory. Um, my questions, I actually have two questions. They both focus on uh, two bound uh, core games. Yeah. Now in chapter um, two, um, you have a very elegant characterization of the uh, nucleolus of two bound core games, mm -hmm. because you show that the nucleolus is exactly what you get if you apply the Talmud rule to the associated uh, bankruptcy game. Yeah. So that's in a sense quite similar to what uh, Auman and Moshler have done. I think it was in 1985, right? Where yes. they discovered that a very old rule from the Talmud actually corresponded to the nucleolus. Actually, they went the other way around. So they started from the, the Talmud rule and then discovered that yeah. it actually coincided with the nucleolus and you go the other way. But one could also um, take, let's say, a different approach. Uh, one could say, well, start from a, a two-bound core game. Yeah. As you nicely show, it always induces in a very natural way a bankruptcy uh, um, game. Yeah. Now, there are many bankruptcy rules. Again, I'm not an expert here. Um, uh, I think uh, Vincent René knows much more about it than I do. But I, I know that there, I have heard many different bankruptcy rules that are yeah. in the literature. Yeah. So one could take one of them and apply it to uh, the two bound, yeah, like that, apply it to the bankruptcy game and then translate it back to the two bound core game. Mm. And uh, one would just get a specific core selection. So for instance, you um, show that for instance, the nucleolus of the two bound core game can be established in this way if you take the Talmud rule. Mm. But instead of the Talmud rule, you could also have taken, uh, well, one of the other bankruptcy rules in the literature in order to obtain perhaps some new core selections in, in two-bound core games. So did you think about this approach and how interesting or fruitful do you think this approach could be for generating, let's say, new or maybe already existing core selections for two-bound core games? Thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, the new claims can be described by the the uh, low exact compound or any low bound and plus uh, uh, the time of the location of a uh, backdrop say program and uh, yeah indeed we tried other backdrop rules for example the uh, the egalitarian core we, we have so egalitarian core of two bound core games is signal valued and uh, we tried to find the relation between the egalitarian core and the uh, construct equal words rule because it's very like very two same uh, two similar solutions, but uh, we find some counterexample. It's it's not uh, uh, we can uh, express uh, egalitarian core with uh, uh, construct equal words rule, and uh, <laughs> we also tried the uh, tau value, which uh, for bankruptcy game it coincides to a uh, uh, the adjust proportional rule. But uh, yeah, we tried to extend the uh, adjust uh, proportional rule and the proportional to with the same expression but uh, we didn't get a uh, like uh, that's a classic solution in bankruptcy uh, in comparative games uh in the other side i think uh, dr quant at all they extend uh, many bankruptcy rules for comp compromise stable games and also i think maybe yeah i mean if we use a backdrop zero, we can get some solutions for two bound core games, but I don't think it coincides with uh, classic solutions for cooperative games. Yeah, so that's why I'm saying that, um, well, perhaps it could also be a way of generating new core selections for two bound core games. Because yeah. um, if you look at the uh, bankruptcy uh, literature, so most of the bankruptcy rules uh, have some axiomatic characterization. So they're yeah. shown that they satisfy some appealing properties and that will transfer then over to the two bound core game so maybe it's also a way to generate new solution concepts for two yeah, bound yes, core yes. games so, so what is your view on that so do you think there is a, a virtue in in finding new appealing 
solution concepts for two bound core games in this way? Mm, yes, it's a new, uh, definitely a new solution. And also, we can character it with some independent properties. I guess, yeah, we can do this in a further uh, research. Yeah, but uh, yeah, for, yeah, we, I mean, it, uh, did, it didn't coincide with the classic solutions. But yes, it's new. So the point is, is that uh, like a good solution? Let's say. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, then let me turn to my second question. Um, so uh, again, about the uh, two bound uh, okay. core game. So you have this very elegant characterization of the nucleolus, but also of uh, the egalitarian uh, um, core, right? Yeah. Um, so what about, let's say, perhaps the most famous solution concept for cooperative games, uh, the Shapley value? Mm -hmm. So suppose that you have a two bound core game, which would be convex, which would imply that the Shapley value would be in the core. Yeah. Um, so in a sense, the Shapley value would be a core selection. Yes. Um, did you try to um, characterize the Shapley value of a two bound core games in, in terms of the, the bounds? Did, did, you, did you try this? And um, if so, um, what, what did you find? You, sorry, you mean for call, uh, convex to bound core game or for general to bound core game? Yeah, I mean, in general, uh, it general. may be the case that uh, the Shapley value may be outside the core, yes, right? If yes. the game is not convex, it's not guaranteed that the Shapley value will be in the core. Yeah. And, yeah. well, given that you look at two bound core games, so you characterize the core by uh, upper and lower bound, mm. it seems most natural to focus on core selections, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. And if you have a convex two bound core game, it's, it's guaranteed that Shapley value would be a, a core selection. Thank you for your question. Uh, the Shapley value, yeah, like you said, it's not necessary in your core and for a convex game, it's in your core. And uh, in, in the scissors, there is a conclusion which said that there exists a convex two-bound core game. And given a general two-bound core game, you can always find a convex two-bound core game. And we can also, uh, and we also prove that it's unique so if we consider a convex to bound core game, it's basically it's uh, uh, like uh, only one game we can consider give a call. And for general to bound core game, we character in our chapter three we character the nuclear linear egalitarian core uh, are based on the reduced game property and the convex reduced game property. Uh, both these two game, uh, properties are based on a very important prop, uh, important theorem, which means that all reduced games uh, with all core elements are again reduced games. But if uh, for a general two bound core game, the Shapley value is not necessary in a core, so it, we cannot use this uh, theorem. Then we cannot use like reduced game property or converse reduced game property to character it. But yeah, we can character in other uh, properties maybe it works but not mm -hmm. with reduced game properties yeah but that, that's why i'm saying suppose that you would have a convex uh, yeah. uh, two-bound core game right then the shapley value would be in the core so did yes. you think well, okay let me phrase it this way do you think it, it would be possible by uh, to uh, characterize the shapley value in those games in terms of the upper and lower bounds of the two-bound core mm -hmm. game do you think that's possible Thank you for your question. Yes, I think it's possible, but uh, like I said, for a convex to one core game, uh, basically it's like one game, not, not one game. For we can write the expression of the convex to one core game, which is uh, in in one theorem we find the uh, uh, convex game which has the same core of two one core game. Actually, that is a unique convex to one core game. So if we consider convex to one core game, that basically we consider this game. And uh, yeah, and uh, then we can use some, uh, but uh, for example, the uh, Shapley value equals to uh, the allocation of a random around rule for backdrop problems, but uh, we cannot write uh, the same expression use uh, like the new clearness of the tamed rule. So maybe not in this way to calculate it, but in other way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor 
Dr. Sun, who regretfully is not present, uh, uh, also not online, but he has sent the question to uh, Professor Van Meulen, who will then pose the question of Professor Sun. Um, yes, dear candidate, again. So, um, as the chairman already explained, uh, unfortunately, Professor Sun uh, could not uh, join us. He for sure could not join us uh, here uh, in this room, but uh, unfortunately also, uh, as it turned out, uh, it was not possible to join online. So uh, he uh, did send uh, a question. And uh, the question of Professor Soon relates to uh, chapter four, yeah. um, where you introduce two uh, mechanisms, the uh, divide and choose and uh, the uh, divide uh, and object uh, mechanisms. And uh, both these uh, mechanisms uh, rely on ordering the players in uh, ascending order of, uh, uh, of their claims. Yeah. Um, and that way you, you can characterize the constraint equal awards uh, rule. Yeah. Uh, so the question is actually what happens if you, um, so how essential is this ascending order? So what would happen if you would reverse the order? Would you still get the constraint equal awards allocation or would you get something else or would you not get anything, right? So the question is what, uh, what do you, th so how, uh, how essential is, is this ascending order in the proof and what would happen if you would uh, change the order. Thank you for question. Uh, yeah, I guess if we change the order, we yeah, of course there is a new mechanism for the bankruptcy problem, but I don't think uh, there is a nice equilibrium in the new bankruptcy game, uh, game not collective game, mm -hmm. because uh, in our mechanism, uh, we give an uh, assisting order of claims, because actually the first uh, uh, I mean, with the small claims agents, they claim first I get, and they get last. But if we change the orders, uh, they will be the first one to pick up the, like one piece of cake. And then they can get more than his claim. So it will not be a nice equilibrium or a good uh, allocation for a bankruptcy problem because one won't get more than his claim. So I don't think we can like character. Okay, but so, it, but uh, okay. So I, I think I understand what you're saying, and that would also be my first answer. But do you, are you saying now that it's not an Escher equilibrium, or that it is not a solution that would satisfy that uh, you get uh, at most your claim? Uh, because you could have an Escher equilibrium while it violates that particular condition, I guess. So, yeah. so what are you saying? It's not an Escher equilibrium, or it uh, <laughs> it's a very bad solution? So. Uh, yes, it's a very bad solution because one, okay. uh, yeah. But yeah. it could be an Nash equilibrium still, because mm. that I, I'm not sure, so. Yeah, maybe for some, for some specific, uh, specific bankruptcy game problems, yes, but uh, I don't think it's for general bankruptcy games, there is a Nash equilibrium, yeah. And that would also be my guess, and I guess also Professor Soon, so thank you for your answer. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes the first round and gives us an opportunity to enter into a second round. Um, it would be Professor Van Meulen as the first one in the second round. My suggestion is that each will most preferably have short questions. Yeah, thank you again. Um, so, yeah, so I will continue uh, the... Um, so uh, my question with a question on Chapter 5, and it will be, uh, I think, uh, not a, a very long question. So in chapter five, you have um, um, an implementation of this uh, set uh, M mm -hmm. um, using, uh, so the, the depending, using Pareto optimal Nash equilibrium uh, and uh, strong equilibrium. Yes. Um, and so that means that you're not using dominant strategy uh, equilibrium, which would, I guess, be in most uh, social choice uh, se uh, settings, uh, the, the first uh, uh, you could say solution concept of choice, mm. um, and I, I believe you even have a, you know, some results on that that uh, that is not uh, possible, um, I guess. Uh, so my question, my first question would be: Is that uh, is my hunch correct? Uh, the second question is then: um, But what would happen if you would, would insist on dominant strategy equilibrium? So there are sit there are situations, I guess, in which you could have a, a dominant strategy. For example, if my dip is one. Um, then I guess it would be a dominant strategy to actually report that. Um, I cannot imagine that that would be a bad thing to do. Mm. Um, so my question is a little bit, um, 
uh, to what extent, uh, so how, how often will it fail, right? I think that's, that's my question. Um, so uh, um, is it uh, most of the time not possible to get a dominant strategy, maybe only in those extreme cases or maybe something in between? Or so uh, what is your view on that? Thank you for the question. Uh, I mean, a dominant strategy means that uh, uh, it, it's his like best strategy, no matter what else other the players do. And uh, I but guess, like I said, so if my dip is one, then reporting one cannot be a bad thing to do. I guess, right? I cannot imagine. So sorry. That I get. So if my dip would be one. Mm -hmm. Um, then I cannot imagine that re reporting one would be a bad thing to do, no matter what the others do. So, yes, so in yes. that case, I would have yeah. a dominant strategy, I guess. Yes, uh, yeah, if your DP is one, I guess, yeah, zero is a dominant strategy. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, so then, um, so my question is then, uh, in s well, does it fail often, right? So uh, mm -hmm. uh, is it true that in most cases you will not have a dominant strategy or, right, only in those cases you do have one? So, so that's my question. How often does it go wrong? I mean, for. I mean, if his dip is very close to zero and one, I guess. I mean, if his dip is very close to zero, then I guess his dominant strategy is always one. And if dip is one, close to one, mm. his dominant strategy. Yeah, okay, is yeah, you report, I guess, mm. the optimal thing to do. Uh, yes, okay, so that flips around, but okay, I, I mean, understand, yes. I mean, for, yeah, I mean, for the dips in the middle, I, Maybe it's there is no dominant strategy for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean how often? So <laughs> uh, maybe we need to calculate the uh, like the interval in the middle. You know, not very close to one and uh, zero. Okay, but so if it would be one over a hundred, would that be fine or? Mm, yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's, there's still a few minutes, uh, so I'm happy to give the floor to Professor van der Brink. Uh, thank you. So I have a question about the first paragraph of your thesis, uh, because there you write that uh, you assume players to be rational and intelligent, where rationality implies that players choose their strategy so to maximize their individual payoff. And intelligence means that players are capable to deduce their best strategies. Um, now, my question is, do, does rationality not imply intelligence or, or, or maybe more precise when you assume players to be rational, then it seems to me that uh, intelligence is redundant because if you assume that they choose the best strategy, you don't need to know whether they are capable to do that. So the question is, does rationality imply intelligence? So it's about uh, mechanism for bankruptcy problems. Uh, well, it's about chapter chapter for one, the first part, the, the, the first paragraph of your thesis, like it's about the whole thesis. Intra so you, you mentioned in the first paragraph that you assume players to be rational and intelligent, and then the first I was so usually we assume players to be rational but not necessarily intelligent, but when I see your definition of intelligence, get yeah, it. Uh, that players are capable to deduce their best strategies, and this is chapter one. So this is this is the first paragraph. So this applies to the full thesis. So wh why do you assume in any of the chapters players to be intelligent when you also assume them to be rational? Uh, thanks for your question. I mean, normally we assume rational and intelligent because. Uh, intelligent means that uh, every player can like carry, uh, can calculate uh, every possible outcome in a game, but if they are not uh, intelligent, so mm, like they don't know like all possible possible outcomes, so they can um, yeah I mean they can choice, but it's not uh, uh, I mean it's not a thing we consider in these theaters. Yeah. And uh, but with rationality, you assume that they choose so to maximize their. So you mean to choose? 
when you when you choose a strategy to maximize your payoff, then I would say I don't care whether you under that assumption we don't need to know whether the players are capable of doing that. Uh, yeah, I mean it's a very general assumption. We just uh, use it, and uh, I guess it's. Uh, You may briefly conclude your response. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for telling my PhD defense. Okay. The, uh, Dudukong, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And I request that you and your company await the results of over deliberations and over return in this room. Thank you. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream. Problem-based learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the Skills Lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their change semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Chemlock campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project that includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. 
After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association. If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time round, but you get to use to it quickly. And having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while.
完了，拿着合照，合照完了那个，不，啊对，合照的时候你可以稍微偏一点，然后我就你你就给我，对，放在这儿。Dr. Dukong, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. And in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Peters is authorized to confer upon you the academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Dudugong, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Uh, dear Dudu, congratulations again. Thank you. You had two supervisors, yeah. uh, myself, but the other one being much more important even, uh, which is Boss. And Boss will now speak out the Laudatio. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Dear Dr. Gong, dear Dudu. Thank you both. Let me start by congratulating you, but also your family and friends with your achievement of obtaining the degree of doctor at Maastricht University. I'm proud on you and also the successful collaboration we had, especially of course, because you are my first PhD student. Yes. You came to the Netherlands, Maastricht, to spend one and a half years under supervision of Hans Peters as part of your double PhD degree. Hans invited me to join your supervision team and our first meeting was on Thursday, March 25, 2000, in the year 2021, at 2 p.m. in the room A1.23 of the SBE building at the Tongerse Straat. <laughs> you came here with a working paper on, on the sequential petition method for bankruptcy problems which was later that year accepted for publication in the journal TOP and appears as chapter four in your dissertation yeah. and the working paper on claims check problems. We started working on cooperative games with transferable utility, in particular on the axiomatics of the coalitional Nash solution and a revealed preference analysis on the core. This turned, however, out to be much more complicated than we initially expected. And despite all our efforts, we did not make the progress we hoped for. When the summer approached, it made you a bit nervous. You had only one and a half years. So we looked for another project and started studying of what we call now two-bound core games. This was based on the work of Dr. Quant from Tilburg University, 
who is part of your assessment committee and today present as opponent in your defense committee. This project turned out to be a better fit and you soon made a lot of progress. It resulted in our first joint discussion paper and chapter two of your thesis. The paper was recently accepted for publication in Annals of Operations Research. Also, the follow-up paper, Reduced to Bound Core Games, chapter three of your thesis, followed quickly and was recently accepted for publication in Mathematical Methods of Operations Research. The last months before the summer, we focused on mechanisms for division problems with single dip preferences, which led to another working paper and chapter five of your thesis. In the meantime, we even published another paper on the random arrival rule for NTU bankruptcy problems in economics letters, which did not even end up as part of your dissertation. It is impressive how fruitful and productive one and a half years can be. I think it was a remarkable experience also for you, where you have learned a lot. Yeah. I hope you also look back on a pleasant stay in the Netherlands, in Maastricht, despite the food. <laughs> I was happy to see you becoming good friends with your office mate, Joop van Sloon, who acted today as a, one of your paronyms. And I well remember the times you both came to my home to play some board games. Dudu, I've got to know you as a very kind and hardworking person. I enjoyed our collaboration and I'm sure you will find a good job back in your home country or somewhere else after finishing your PhD degree in China. I wish you success and all the best. Thank you very much, Boss. Dear Dr. Gong, you. Uh, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you and your family and friends with the degree you have acquired. And I would like to thank the members of the degree committee for their contribution. Before closing this session, we have one member of the degree committee which is online and, and he would like to congratulate you also. Thank you. Dear Dudu, also congratulations with your very nice thesis and your successful defense and being a young doctor now. I hope we can meet uh, in the future. Uh, I hope you have uh, a nice day, a nice celebration and, uh, and a good trip uh, and stay back uh, to China. Thank you. With this, I close this session, uh, only mentioning that we will take a picture here and a picture at the stairs, and, yeah. and then congratulate you once again uh, next to the stairs. So I close the session.